The Long-Legged Beast of the Magura Forest by Mike Jesus His sheepskin coat was covered with snow and mud. The rifle strapped across his back was broken in half. Without greeting us, he stumbled to the barkeep and demanded Palenka. What happened to you, Yosko? asked Halshin, his big belly bouncing with laughter. Got into a fight with that dog of yours? This got a couple of laughs from the men, but as soon as the woodsman turned around, all mirth disappeared from the room. Yosko was built like a bull and wore a true woodsman's beard, yet beyond the rough face, plain as day, we could all see he was terrified. The woodsman didn't answer. He just swallowed the barkeep's offering. It wasn't until the second shot that he spoke. There's something in the woods. Damn right there's something in the woods. A damn snowstorm. What the fool you are for walking around during the winter, Halshin said. But fool or not, come join us, let me buy you a drink. As soon as someone closes that damn door, you might actually find some warmth here. Outside, a mighty storm raged in the dying light of the afternoon. Peeking out of the curtain of snow were the outlines of the Magura Forest, a forest thick enough to be dangerous even on the brightest of summers. As the door closed, I quietly took pity on any man who would get lost in that wilderness. The woodsman took two more helpings of Palenka before he sat down amongst us. The liquor smelled heavy off of him, but as soon as he took off his coat, the room filled with the stench of sweat. So, Yosko, last week you sit here and brag about how you finished all the winter preparations a month early, but now we catch you getting lost in the forest. Never took you for a liar. Halshin boomed, hoping to get a response out of the woodsman but his jabs didn't land. The man sitting before us was in no mood for arguments or jokes. What brought you to the forest, friend? Halson finally asked with a hint of kindness in his voice. The woodsman stared into his beer as if it would provide answers to his torment. When no answers presented themselves, he started to speak. Buckle, he said. Ever since we finished the winter work, he has been anxious, kept on howling and biting his paws. Figured taking him out for a quick walk in the forest would help. Now you treat that dog like a child, Halshin hollered. You let that animal sleep in the house, and soon enough it feels entitled to complain. This got a couple of murmurs of agreement from the rest of the table. Bako much like the rest of the village dogs, was a product of untraceable parentage or breed. Yet he wasn't treated like the simple farm animal he was. The woodsman seldom left the house without the dog, kept him by his side whenever he could. He would even converse with it when he thought no one was watching. Even though both the hound and the woodsman were well liked, many crude jokes would be made on account of their relationship. Yet no one felt like joking that night. Where is Baco? someone asked. The woodsman didn't answer. Instead, he took a dull swig of his beer. Getting out of the house helped, he said. As soon as we got to the forest, he was off like a cannonball, jumping around in the snow, running back and forth on the path. Haven't seen him that happy all month. I wanted him to have his fun. Figured I would take him with me to check the feeder in the salt lakes. The woodsman's words were hollow. It was as if his body was present in the pub, but his mind was still somewhere off in the forest. That's when I found the tracks. There's something in the woods. Ah, I understand now, Halshin said, grinning. You went out for some out-of-season hunting, Yosko. We're amongst friends here, so no one will report you. But if you do find yourself with some venison sausage, it would be a sin not to share. The rest of the table laughed hungrily. So you had to run in with a bear. Is that what happened with your rifle? No, the woodsman said and took another heavy swig of his beer. The tracks did not belong to a bear or a deer or a boar or anything else that roams our forest. It was something bigger. 
something heavier. Something taller. Taller? Someone asked. Taller. These tracks went deep. The legs that left them were tall. The tracks were still of hooves. Long, flat hooves. Thought that maybe I had come across some freak deer. Being a hard year, figured a bit of sausage would cheer everyone up. For a moment the woodsman smiled. For a moment our drinking buddy was back. But then his eyes glazed over. What we found wasn't a deer. Malbaco played in the snow, I followed the tracks. They ended up leading me all the way past the stream. They led to... The woodsman paused. It was as if he had suddenly became aware of who he was speaking to. He looked up at Halshin. They led to your fields. I trust my potatoes are doing well? Halshin laughed. Others laughed with him. No, the woodsman said, silencing the crowd. No, Halshin, your fields are... It's as if wild boars dug through everything you planted. Everything is dug up. There's mud everywhere. That's ridiculous, someone said. No boar is smart enough to dig through the snow. Is this true, Yosko? You're not pulling my leg? When the woodsman shook his head, all the joy left Halshin's eyes. For a moment, Halshin sat wordlessly, letting the anger fill his cheeks. What happened next? Who dug up my fields? Baco was too busy running around in the snow to notice the tracks. But when we reached the fields, there was no snow to play in. I tried to get him to follow a scent, to track down whatever animal destroyed your fields, but he didn't want to. The woodsman's voice jumped an octave. His dark eyes closed. Baco wanted to go home. See, this is what happens when you treat your dog like a child. Alshin slapped the table, nearly spilling his beer. You treat an animal like a man and they start to form opinions. That hound was meant to follow the scent. That hound was meant to lead you to the animals that wrecked my fields. He did, the woodsman said. Baco wanted to go home, but I forced him to follow the scent. I forced him to track down the animal. Good. Halshin said, calming. I have to remind the animal who is the master from time to time. Halshin looked beneath the table, as if he expected the dog to be there. But Baka was nowhere to be found. For a moment, it looked as if the man would ask about the dog, but he didn't. What did Baka find? He didn't want to lead me, but I insisted. The woodsman said, his head bent over his beer in sorrow. He led me through the muddy fields down to the valley below. For a while, I could see the tracks. I could see those long-legged hooves in the snow. But when we walked down the valley, the snow disappeared. All that was left was mud. Mud and fog. Bako kept on whimpering. He kept on looking back at me, begging me with his eyes to leave, but I didn't listen. I just kept them walking through the mud, hoping for some good meat. We were walking through the fog for about ten minutes when I heard it. I heard the animal, like the mating grunt of a deer, but darker. I heard it coming from above. Above? Someone asked. From the sky? Yosko, are you trying to tell us you saw a deer mating in the sky? No one laughed. Looking at the woodsman's terrified face, no one dared to laugh. The fog was far too thick to see through. I was barely able to keep track of Baco, but I could hear it. I could hear something groaning above us. At that point, even I was scared. I couldn't see anything. The dog was nervous, and whatever was out there in the fog was big. I tried to turn around. I was finally going to listen to Baco's instincts, but it was far too late. 
The woodsman attempted to continue his story, but no words left his mouth. He was still out there, out in the forest, trying to make sense of what him and his dog had seen. A round of belinkers on me, barkeep, how she nodded, breaking the tension for a split second. Yet, as the glasses of clear liquid were placed on the table, the pub descended back into complete silence. Everyone was waiting for the woodsman to speak. He remained wordless until he swallowed his medicine. The legs, he finally said. The legs were the first thing I saw. Tall, grey legs attached to a body that I could not see. Those skeletal limbs were enough for me. As soon as I saw them, I ran. I ran and Baco followed me, but we weren't alone. The beast ran behind us. Its steps were frantic and clumsy, but it moved fast. Even those disgustingly thin legs, it kept keeping up with us. And the groaning. The groaning kept on getting closer, as if whatever was making those horrible sounds was descending from the sky. Out of nowhere, the animal put on a burst of speed and overtook us. It nearly trampled us as it ran ahead. Then it stopped. A head descended from the fog on a sickeningly long neck. Eyes blacker than the darkest night. With long purple tongue and giant yellow teeth. Staring at me was a maddening snout of the beast I couldn't imagine in my worst nightmares. It foamed at its curled lips. It snapped its monstrous maw. The beast meant us harm. I squeezed one shot, went wide. By the time I loaded the next, the woodsman nodded to his rifle, propped up against the table. The barrel of the gun was crushed and bent, halved by a thick-toothed bite. There wasn't a second shot. I fell to the ground and that horrible head descended towards me. Even past the mist I could see those big dark eyes. They weren't dumb. They weren't like the eyes of any animal I've ever seen. No. There was malice in those eyes. The beast wanted me dead. Not because of hunger. Not because of fear but out of pure spite. For a moment I was sure my days had been numbered, but then... Baco, someone whispered. The woodsman drained his mug and nodded. He jumped at the beast's neck and tore into it. I didn't look back. I just ran. I abandoned him. I left Baco alone with whatever spawn of hell that creature was. All that could be heard was the howling of the wind outside. We were all trying to make sense of the woodsman's story, trying to figure out if the man had simply lost his mind in the forest, or whether there was any truth to what he had said. Halshin broke the silence with his fist. Buckle died an honorable death for a dog, he said, slamming the table. He died serving his master. Barkeep! A round of palenka in the hound's honor. To murmurs of agreement, another round was poured. Before the glasses were raised, however, Halshin struck a gentle tone. Yosko, none of us here doubt your story, but you have to admit it is a difficult one to grasp. Impossible to grasp, I might say, to those of a more gentle nature. It has been a hard year. The last thing we need is the women and children being scared of some long-legged monster in the woods. I suggest to you and everyone gathered here that we not speak of this matter further. I am sure that whatever beast you encountered in the woods will not stay there for long. If there are still traces of it come spring, we can investigate the matter further. But as far as I am concerned, all you and Baco encountered in the woods was a restless bear. The table turned to the woodsman. We all studied his blank face in search of a response. Yes, the woodsman said after a long moment of thought. Let us not speak of this further. Tobacco, Alshin said. 
Tobacco, we all cheered. Once the glasses were drained and slammed down on the wood, another wave of silence followed. No one knew what to say. Surely it was no time to cast doubt on the woodsman's story, and it was most definitely no time to make jokes. But conversations around the village pub seldom revolved around anything other than humour or distrust. He was a good dog, the woodsman whispered. The others started to murmur their agreement, but suddenly everyone went quiet. There was a scratch at the door. Something was trying to get inside of the pub. What was that? Someone said. Behind us, the barkeep's shotgun cocked into action. He was aiming straight at the door. The fear in the room was palpable. What once seemed like the fever dream of a man lost in the woods now seemed like an undeniable reality. There was something outside, and it wanted in. The force on the door grew more erratic. With each second, I could feel the sanity draining out of everyone in the room. We were all thinking of the long-legged monstrosity that the woodsman had described. We were all fearing for our lives. But then the scratches were joined by another sound. A familiar sound. Behind the door, a dog whimpered. Boko! The woodsman yelled as he leaped to his feet and rushed the door. You're alive! The dog was alive, but barely. Bako's fur was matted in blood, and he scarcely managed to stay upright on his paws. Whatever struggle Bako had emerged from was a brutal one. The pub immediately mobilized into a flurry of activity. Within seconds, the injured dog was wrapped up in the woodsman's coat and carried out into the night. In the spirit of communal support, or morbid curiosity perhaps, the whole pub followed the woodsman to the village veterinarian. Soon, Halshin and I were the only ones left in the pub. You think the woodsman was telling the truth? I asked. Your school has a strange relationship with his dog, Halshin said, waddling over behind the bar and grabbing a bottle of Palenka. But I do not take him for a liar, nor a madman for that matter. The thought of some long-legged monster hiding in the woods, though... As the rest of the men trudged through the snow and darkness, hoping to save Bako, Halshin poured two shots of the clear liquid. Let me once again suggest that we do not speak of this matter until spring. Whether there is or isn't something in the forest right now is not of our concern. It is the winter. It has been a hard year. Let us simply tend to our homes and enjoy the fruits of our labor. He handed me the glass. I accepted it. At least the dog is alive. At least the dog is alive. And then, in a little bastion of civilization surrounded by a dark forest, we drank. I'm a village veterinarian. Last week, I saw a dog die and come back to life. Drunk and panicked and loud, they crowded my living room. One moment I was calmly watching the evening news, enjoying the warmth of my fireplace, and the next I was surrounded by village drunks. They demanded my help. At the front of the group stood Yosko, the village woodsman. Wrapped up in his massive coat, he held his dog, Bako. The eyes that looked up at me from the bloodied sheepskin weren't the eyes I was accustomed to seeing begging for scraps around the village. They were the eyes of a dying animal. Not even the most skilled of veterinarians could save the dog. His injuries weren't meant to be treated with medicine. They were meant to be treated with a shotgun. The crowd was insistent in their pleas for help. Yet, when I asked what happened, they went quiet. The dog was attacked by a bear, someone said. The rest of the group murmured along, unconvincingly. With a bloodied hound in my arms and the scent of an obvious lie in the air, I ordered the drunken crowd out of my home. Only the woodsman remained. Save him, he said, his voice colder than the snowstorm outside. Yosko, I don't think there's much that I can do here. Vako is- Do what you can, 
he said, and with that, my job was set out for me. I quelled the dog's whimpers with a tranquilizer and did my best to sew up his wounds, but the work I was doing was more symbolic than functional. The bites that mangled the animal's body ran so thick I was surprised the dog was even capable of breathing. By the time my work was finished, the animal's flesh was stitched out of sight, but I knew his injuries ran deeper than any needle could fix. Your score, I said, looking at the bloodied creature on my table. Baco is not going to make it through the night. I can make this easy for him. He won't feel a thing. With one injection, I can- No, the woodsman said. If it wasn't for Baco, I would surely be dead. He fought the beast and still had enough strength to come back to the village. The dog had the will to survive. I will aim to respect it. The beast? I asked. The bear, he replied with no emotion in his voice. The woodsman scooped up his dying dog back into the sheepskin coat and lumbered toward the door. Thank you. You know how much Baco means to me. I will not forget your kindness. I gave the woodsman some antibiotics and promised to stop by to check up on Baco in the morning. I expected my visit to be purely for consolation, but I did not tell the woodsman that. That night, as I fell asleep to the crackling of the fireplace and the howling of the snowstorm outside, I couldn't help but think about the mystery of that bloodied hound. Animals seldom limp away from bear attacks, and when they do, they have bites and claw marks to prove it. Baco had neither. He showed no signs of being cut by a bear's paws, and the bites that covered his body were unlike the sharp incisions a bear leaves behind. The bites were heavy and thick, as if they came from the more of a dull-toothed nightmare. Whatever creature had attacked the dog, I knew it wasn't a bear. I woke up to heavy knocks on my door around sunrise. It was the woodsman. Much like the night previous, he had his coat off and nestled against his chest. Something is wrong, he said as he walked into my living room. Yosko, I said. The dog was not meant to survive. And there was nothing else that could be... The words froze in my throat. With a mind still hazy from my dreamless sleep, I tried to make sense of what was in front of me. I blinked. Baco's big brown eyes were peeking out at me from the woodsman's coat. Something is wrong, the woodsman repeated, setting the dog down on the ground. The hound stood on his own without issue. His fur was matted in dark remnants of his blood, but aside from that, the dog looked unharmed. As I stared at the resurrected dog, he started to wag his tail. I woke up to him licking my face, the woodsman said, sitting down at my table. His mammoth body slumped on the chair. Whatever amount of sleep Baco had woken him from was not enough. I convinced him that what I was witnessing was a miracle, and that what I was looking at was an act of God. It was the only explanation I could conceive of at the time. The woodsman had lost his wife two years prior. The dog was the only living remnant of their union. Surely a loving God would take pity on the man. Did you pray for the dog to get healthy? I asked. The woodsman nodded. Yet there was little joy in his eyes from getting his prayers answered. There was something wrong with him. I was overjoyed when I woke up, but... There's something wrong with Baco. The dog sat down and watched me with eyes full of life. He seemed perfectly fine. In fact, he seemed to be begging for scraps. Yosko, I think we're looking at a miracle here. This dog seems perfectly healthy. He's not, the woodsman said, and then, as if his words had awakened something in the dog, Baco's demeanor changed. Suddenly he was back on all fours, but the stance he struck was anything but natural. His paws spread out sideways, 
as if the legs he was standing on were suited for a table rather than a living being. Bako stared out into the ether, craning his neck as if he was reaching for something. The dog's loving gaze was gone. His eyes were pitch black. But then, as if some invisible switch was flipped, Baka was back. The dog sat back down, scratched himself behind his ear, and then looked up to me to remind me he's hungry. That, the woodsman said, that is what is wrong with Baka. I stared at the dog, hoping that he would shed some light on the situation, but instead he just licked his nose. Could be a seizure, I said, taking a shot in uncharted territory. Looked a bit like that epileptic pig Halshin had last summer. You went with it to a specialist in the city. Maybe you could ask him. Halshin cannot know about this, the woodsman said. Everyone who came with me the previous night, they can't know about this. Why? I asked. For a moment he regarded me with his dark eyes, probing my trustworthiness, and then he spoke. It was not a bear that attacked Baco. It was Helshin who insisted we tell people it was a bear. He says that my story would panic the village. But there was no bear attack. No. The beast that attacked us was... The woodsman's eyes wandered. He looked around my shelves. Do you have any palenka? Not one for the drink, Yosko. What attacked Baco? I have never seen or heard of the madness that I saw in the forest, the woodsman said after a heavy sigh. We were out in the woods following the tracks of what I could have sworn was just a really big deer when we met it. It was like something out of hell itself. Long legs, the neck of a snake, eyes like a nightmare. The thing would have bit my head off if it was not for Baco. He defended me. He defended me, and I ran like a coward. Sensing the tremble in his owner's voice, Baco got up and sat down by the woodsman's feet. There was nothing but discomfort in Yosko's eyes. Is there any way I can help him? He doesn't seem to be in pain, but is there anything I can do? The woodsman asked. The woodsman's incredible story was still settling in my mind. I could not think straight. Make sure he takes the antibiotics I gave you last night, I finally said. The woodsman's face remained unchanged. He looked down at the dog as if it had the answers. Your score. After the state the dog was in last night, it is a miracle that he is alive. Celebrate that. Remember that. Perhaps these little episodes will go away soon enough. Like you said, he does not seem to be in pain. Just make sure he takes the pills. I did my best to sound like a professional talking to a client, but I was dealing in the realm of the bazaar with a man whose sanity was starting to seem questionable. The woodsman picked up on my tone. You don't believe me. He said. To be honest, I am still having trouble believing that Baco is alive. For a split second, the woodsman's mouth twitched. Me too. He smiled. Just please, do not tell Halshin or anyone else in the village about this. I need some peace and quiet to think about it all. The mystery of the dog was discomforting me. I was more than happy not to speak about it. With a handshake from the woodsman, he parted, his resurrected dog tucked beneath his coat. Keeping the thoughts of Barco's miraculous recovery out of my mind during the day was manageable. There was television and the occasional visitor to keep me occupied. The night, however, was more difficult to contend with. It was during that night that I would find myself standing at my window and looking out at the forest beyond. It was in the darkness of the Megora Hills that I could imagine the creature that the woodsman spoke of. 
I did not believe in the woodsman's tale. I did not want to believe the woodsman's tale. But I couldn't help but wonder about the creature that he described. The thought of a tall-legged beast that maims and resurrects hiding in those snow-peaked trees stole plenty of sleep from me. For three days I distracted myself, and for two nights I lay sleepless in bed. It was on the third night I found the woodsman back at my door. He stood in my doorway wearing his sheepskin coat, looking like a man who had seen death personified. That injection you suggested, his voice dark and low. Do you have it? To euthanize the dog? I asked. He nodded. Baco has gotten worse. He's... He's not himself anymore. I should never have brought him over in the first place. The dog should have went when it was his time. The harrowed look in the woodsman's eyes let me know his decision was final. I did not argue. I simply retreated to my medical cabinet, grabbed the necessary supplies, and joined the woodsman at the door. When I tried walking out into the snow, however, his arm blocked my passage. Just give me the syringe and tell me what to do. There is no reason for you to join me. I did not want to argue with the man. He was far too big, and there was alcohol on his breath. But I could not let him put down the dog by himself. When I brought up his lack of training or experience, the woodsman refused to relent. Yet, when I mentioned the fact he might accidentally hurt the dog, his face softened. The woodsman let go of the doorway. Those episodes that Baco was having, they became more frequent. They became constant, the woodsman said, his voice weak with sorrow. You called them seizures, but they were not what they are. No. When Baco gets into those horrible fits, he's not having a seizure. He's growing. Growing? I asked. For a moment, the woodsman just stared at me, as if he was trying to make sense of the whole affair along with me. Growing, he finally said. When that long-legged beast bit Baco, it changed him. The change just took time. I fear of what will happen if Baco is allowed to continue to change. It has to be stopped. It has to be stopped, and no one can know of this. I promised the woodsman my silence and followed him to his cottage. When his wife was still alive, she kept a small herd of sheep. Those sheep were long sold, but the barn which once held them still stood. It was in that empty barn that the woodsman kept Baco. When the doors opened, however, I knew that I was no longer looking at a familiar village dog. I was looking at a different creature altogether. The animal stood on limbs so tall that he would have reached our eye line if he had a normal neck. But Baco's neck was no longer normal. It had stretched into a discomforting mass of fur that pulsed with each breath the creature took. His snout still held some resemblance to that of a dog yet the tongue that hung from his maw was the color of asphyxiated skin. I was looking at something patently unholy. For a moment the creature looked down at me, and somewhere behind those big dumb eyes I could see a trace of something sentient. But then a throaty yelp and the animal buckled. Its eyes turned black. Its limbs stretched out, its neck craned. Ever so slowly, in the soft shimmer of the animal's fur, I could see its body grow. This is the work of the devil, I whispered, making the sign of a cross. This is the work of the long-legged beast, the woodsman said, and it has to end. Please. This has to end. 
The sight of that lanky abomination sowed sweat across my body, but there was a job to be done. With weak knees, I stepped towards the towering dog. With shaking hands, I searched his paws for a vein. With a mind drenched in panic, I tried to do what was necessary. At first, finding the right entry point for the syringe seemed like the biggest of my worries. The creature's abhorrent limbs continued to expand beneath my fingers. Every time I thought I had found a vein, it would be shifted aside by another growth spot. Yet as I searched for a means to put Bako to sleep, another obstacle, a much more troubling obstacle presented itself. Guttural groans, a drip of foul-smelling spit. The creature's dark eyes were no longer staring out into the ether. They were staring straight at me. Like a gigantic snake, the animal that was once Bako spun its neck towards me and regarded me with utter hatred. Its maw opened wide, revealing a symphony of dull yellow teeth. The deep groans turned into a roar. The creature lurched at me. For a frozen instant, my life flashed before my eyes. I could see myself kneeling in front of the creature whose visage had stolen so much sleep from me, about to meet my end in its frothing black-toothed jaws. But then, with the force of a focused artillery fire, the woodsman sprang to my aid. He knocked the beast to the ground, pinning its long neck into the hard dirt of the barn. Inject him! he yelled. Put Baco out of his misery before he grows too strong! The long legs of the beast pummeled me with kicks that stole my breath and clouded my mind with pain. But my hands worked independent of thought. Years of training and developed instincts took control. I found the dog's heartbeat and injected the poison. The beast writhed in resistance as my needle found its mark, but with every second that passed, the struggle dimmed. With every second that passed, the heartbeat beneath my finger grew sluggish, until, after a minute that lasted an eternity, all signs of life faded away. Is he gone? The woodsman asked, still gripping the creature's neck. Yes. He held his grip for a couple more seconds, as if Bako would be reborn once more. But once the impossibility of a second resurrection became apparent, he let go. The woodsman stood up and regarded his dead companion. Drink with me, he finally said. I am not one for drink, but I dared not to argue with the woodsman. The first shot of Polenka I took in his cottage soothed my terrified mind, as did the second and the third. At first we tried making sense of what had happened to Baco, of how a bite from a mysterious creature in the woods could transform a dog so radically. But as the bottle of liquor drained, we spoke of different things. We spoke of the woodsman's wife, of loss, of what a hard winter it had been. In his little cottage at the edge of the dark wood, we drank and commiserated about how hard life could be sometimes. I woke up in my own home with a horrid headache and the faint memories of the night prior. Under the aching exhaustion of a hangover, the horror that I had witnessed the night before seemed a lifetime away. Yet, as I sluggishly went about my day, the memory started to sharpen. I could see the abhorrent monstrosity that towered above us in the barn. I could feel the dog's heartbeat slowly fade into the night. I could hear the woodsman's drunken wails over the senseless death. Yet there was something else I remembered from that night. A distinct moment that had been haunting me ever since I drifted into my conscious mind. As the sun started to redden the winter sky, as I drunkenly propped myself up in his doorway, saying my goodbyes, we shook hands. The woodsman, slurring his speech, thanked me for my silence and my aid. Your hand, I said, feeling the gauze wrapped around his palm. 
What happened? Burnt myself was loading the fireplace. Nothing serious. Last night I did not push the topic further. I was far too drunk to pick up on the lie. Yet, as I sit here, replaying the events of the previous night in my head, I can't help but feel like the woodsman was not being honest. I can't help but feel like the woodsman might have been hiding something from me. Perhaps the wound on his arm was truly from an accident. But I can't help but feel as if Barco had something to do with it. The woodsman was a mountain of a man, but when I looked at him, all I could think about was the crushing reality of human fragility. Once upon a time, he was happy. Once upon a time, you could see him walking through the village hand in hand with his wife, their scrappy dog in tow. But that time was long gone. After the cancer took his wife, the woodsman's world collapsed in on itself. He stopped coming to church. He stopped attending the festivals. He stopped taking part in any facet of communal life that wasn't directly tied to drinking. Even when the man was seen at the pub, he wouldn't take part in the conversations. He would simply sit at his own table, numbing his pain with Palenka. The others tried talking to him. They tried to help the woodsman shoulder his grief, yet the man always refused aid. He seldom spoke, and when he did, it never was of his wife's passing. As the months turned into years and the rest of the village gave up on trying to pull the woodsman away from the edge of darkness, he only had one friend left. His dog, Bako. The towering mass of sadness lumbering through the village was a somber sight, but Bako was always a ray of sunshine to the scene. The weariness of life that plagued the woodsman paled in comparison to the determined excitement of the dog. Bako was constantly eager to play, to chase, to explore. Through jumps and yelps and playful tugs, Bako could even get the woodsman's stone face to break into a smile. The despondent woodsman and his chipper dog were an inseparable duo. When one was near, the other wasn't far behind. It wasn't until one frigid winter morning that I found the woodsman without company. He stood in the yard of his cottage, shovel in hand, trying to dig a hole in the frozen earth. For a while, I just watched him out of my bedroom window, waiting for Barco to run out from behind the barn and start playing in the snow. The longer the dog didn't manifest, the more uneasy I felt. By the time my mother called me down for breakfast, I was far too worried to eat. With dread bubbling in my throat, I put on my coat and walked across the road. Uncle Yosko, why are you digging a hole? I asked. Grave, he said, not looking back. As massive as the man was, the cold earth resisted every dig of his shovel. He wore a glove on his left hand, but his right was covered in a thick layer of bandages. Fresh blood was crawling down the wood of the shovel. A grave? For who? I asked, fearing the worst. The woodsman stomped at the shovel, driving it deep into the ground. With a thickening steam of blood sliding down the handle, he chipped away at the chunk of frozen earth. Bako is dead, he said. It wasn't until I asked him what had happened he turned to face me. I thought that I had seen the true sadness when I saw the woodsman at the funeral, but the face that looked back at me was completely void of life. Bear, he said. A bear? During the winter? What happened? The woodsman didn't answer. He simply turned around and continued to dig. I told him I was sorry for his loss. I told him that if he ever needed anyone to talk to, I was there for him. I almost told him about the cat I lost the summer prior, but the woodsman refused to hear me. The man had a grave to dig. For a while I stood and watched him, trying to come up with something to say, but I knew there were no words that would do him good. 
My child has no business conversing with that drunk, my father yelled when I came back home. For the years that man has been over pouring Palinka into his throat, but two nights ago the dam broke. The madman decided to take his dog for a walk through the forest in the dead of winter. Stumbles into the pub covered in mud, claiming that a beast attacked him and the hound. Drinks himself half to death while telling us the story too. That bastard was lucky to get out alive. He shouldn't be so lucky to talk to my daughter. I was getting ready to yell something back at him, but then something caught my attention. Beast? I asked. Bear, he quickly replied. Yosko and his dog got attacked by a bear. That red nose has the man behaving like an idiot. If Yosko was responsible and treated his hound like an animal instead of a child, he would have stayed at home. It's the winter. None of us have any business in the forest. Baco is dead, Dad, I finally said. Baco is dead and Uncle Yosko is burying him in his yard. The man is crushed. He needs someone to talk to. He needs help. The news of Baco's death calmed my father's tone. But he still insisted I stay away from the woodsman. I don't want to see you hanging around that man. There's no helping him now. I didn't want to believe him. I wanted to believe that with enough care and patience anyone could be helped. So, that morning, as my mother baked a pie, I baked one along with her. As soon as my father passed out for his afternoon nap, I walked across the road to the woodsman's house. A pie for a grieving man wasn't much, but it was the best I could do. I did not find the woodsman in his cottage. Instead, I found him standing in the old barn where his wife once kept sheep. Outside, Barco's grave started to gather snow. Inside, the woodsman was staring at a rifle kept up on the barn wall. When I interrupted the man out of his sorrow-filled trance, he was confused. Why did you bring me a pie? he asked. It's always better to be sad and full than sad and hungry. Why do you care if I am hungry or not? We live in a village that's in the middle of a dark forest. It's good to help each other. It took the woodsman a moment to comprehend. Thank you. I wish I could repay you somehow, but all I have is Belenka. I won't drink with you, but if you want, we can share a slice of pie. I said. The woodsman nodded. The inside of the woodsman's cottage was bare. Most of his furniture and belongings had been traded away in search of more palenka, and what remained was purely functional in value. The only thing that hung on his walls was a singular crucifix and a photograph of his long-gone family. The woodsman, his wife, and Baco. Once upon a time, they all looked happy. Last summer, a truck ran over my cat, I said, as we ate by the woodsman's creaky table. For one spoonful of pie, I regretted saying it. For a moment, I feared that me bringing up my own lass would insult the woodsman, but his face was not one of anger. Mika, good cat, he said, smiling as if he was talking about an old friend. Your father lent her to us when we had mice in the basement. I am sorry for your loss. I am sorry for your loss, too. They don't stay for long, the woodsman said, looking at the family portrait. His eyes quickly moved towards the shelf where the palenka was kept. With all the remnants of a smile disappearing from his face, the woodsman started to get up. I need a... The woodsman jumped to his feet, nearly overturning the table. He stood straight as a nail, his arms extended to his sides. He looked like a man whose limbs had suddenly become foreign, like a man possessed. Uncle Yosko? I asked, pushing the table back to four legs. Are you okay, Uncle Yosko? The man stared off into the distance, as if I didn't exist. His arms shook as if they were trying to grasp something just out of reach. His neck craned, as if his skull was trying to escape his body. 
The man looked utterly unhinged, but then, as if an invisible switch was flipped somewhere deep inside of his brain, the woodsman relaxed. At first it was invisible to him. At first the woodsman simply stared down at his hands, as if his body had somehow betrayed him. But soon enough he remembered. I need a drink, he mumbled as he made his way to the shelf. What was that, Uncle Yasko? Are you alright? I do not know. Disappeared there for a moment, the woodsman said, grabbing the bottle of Pelenka. Lost a lot of sleep last night. Could be that. Or it could be the drinking, I said. Uncle Yasko, that looked like a seizure. Heavy drinking for a long time can cause those. The man took out a shot glass, but he didn't fill it up. Alcohol can cause seizures? He asked, holding the bottle by his chest. Yes, and worse? Alcohol abuse can do so much harm to the brain. One of the worst side effects is the worsening of depressive. The bottle of Palenka came crashing down to the ground. But it wasn't because the woodsman listened to my words. He was back at that horrible state. His feet firmly on the ground, his arms extended as far as they would go, his neck stretched well into discomfort. The woodsman's body was hijacked once again. Yet this time, as he stood in the middle of the broken glass, his look was different. It wasn't that far off gaze I had seen before. The woodsman's look was one of utter hatred and malice. He was staring right at me. From behind those black eyes, I could feel an indescribable hatred reaching out at me. Whatever being possessed the woodsman was one of pure spite and malice. I wanted to run away, but my legs refused to move. Instead, I sat frozen, watching the woodsman's hateful scowl worm its way closer. But then, with a blink, the woodsman returned. He looked down at the broken bottle at his feet. I need to rest, he said. You should go home. Thank you for the pie. I tried to ask the woodsman if I should call a doctor, but my mouth refused to open. I simply managed to smile, a nod, and then returned back home. That evening, as I milked the cows, the woodsman's evil stare stayed with me. In the back of my mind, I could still see that hateful gaze, and with each pull of the udder, I could see his limbs, growing, stretching, reaching out for some unknown cause. I wanted to believe that the woodsman's erratic behavior was grief-induced, or even a byproduct of a late-stage alcoholism, but deep inside I knew. I knew that there was another force at play. Thoughts of the woodsman's soul crucifix lingered in the back of my mind. After he woke up from his nap, my father went to the pub to watch football. It was well after the match ended and the road lights were turned off that my mother asked me to retrieve him. She made some sort of quip about my father's nose turning red, but I barely heard her. I was too preoccupied thinking about what kind of fate could have befallen the woodsman. I took my flashlight, but the moon was bright in the sky. Even though the air had teeth, the night itself was calm. The snow-capped trees of the Megora forest stood still, undisturbed. Bears did roam the forest, but they did so only during the summer. In the winter, they slept. In the winter, they did not kill dogs. For a moment, I just stood still, trying to use the night's silence to clear my mind, but then a throaty groan broke through the calm. The lights of the woodsman's cottage were off, but sound was coming from his property. I had not forgotten his bewildering stare, and the strangeness of his condition still terrified me, but my will to do good overtook my fear. The groans sounded strained. Thoughts of a drunken, grieving man needing help washed out the madness I had seen that afternoon. I knocked on the woodsman's door. It creaked open on its own. Who is it? The woodsman's voice rasped. I brought you a pie this afternoon. I uh, came I came to pick up the dish. Come in. 
Outside of a stream of moonlight, the woodsman's cottage was drenched in pitch darkness. That slither of light, however, bounced straight onto the man's rickety table. A small, natural spotlight illuminated my pie pan. With no words to say, I grabbed the object and turned to leave. But a voice spoke to me from the darkness. Thank you, the woodsman said, his tone labored. Thank you for your kindness. When you walked into the barn to bring me the pie, I was looking at my rifle, thinking about it. Another throaty grunt broke through the calm night. I knew that the woodsman made the sound from the shadows, but the tone was completely inhuman in nature. Do you miss Mika? The voice from the shadows asked. Do you wish to see her again? She's gone, I said. A truck ran her over last summer. The woodsman let out a chuckle, but it was quickly followed by another pained grunt. It wasn't a bear that attacked Buckle, he finally said. The men at the pub told me to say it was a bear, but it wasn't a bear. When Baco and me were in the woods, we met something worse. Much worse. What did you meet in the forest? I asked, thumbing the edge of my flashlight. There was something horribly wrong with the woodsman's voice. Something that made my heart race with the primal urge to flee. I do not know. But when the creature attacked Baco, he started to change. Slowly at first, but the dog started to change. He, he started to grow. Grow? I asked, with my stomach in my chest. Yes. He, his paws grew taller, his neck grew longer, his teeth grew stronger. After the creature in the forest beat him, Bacco started to change. When he was growing, his mind would drift away. What you saw happen while we ate our pie. That was me going through the same changes. Before I put the dog down, he bit me. At first, I thought he passed on the curse of the forest beast to me. But now, now I know that it is not a curse. Something slithered in the darkness. I couldn't help myself. I flicked on my flashlight. I tried to scream, but only a choked gurgle left my throat. My body was completely seized with terror. I wasn't looking at the woodsman. I was looking at a horrid abomination that carried his face. His arms and legs still bent like human limbs, but they were far too long and bony to resemble anything even remotely human. The woodsman's neck had morphed entirely. It slithered like a live rope made of skin, gently pulsing with each beat of his heart. The man was a mess of long-bent flesh, but his face still remained the same. Don't be scared. He groaned. With another animalistic grunt, his head bent and sent a clump of spit to the floor. But soon enough, he was looking back at me. Do you want to see Mika again? You need help. I finally managed to scream. There's something wrong with you and, and you need help. I'm going to call the priest. I turned to dash towards the door, but with one swift motion, the woodsman's leg blocked my path. Like an impoverished spider, the man raised himself to his towering limbs and started to edge towards me. When my mind leaves, my body grows. I can see them. I am with them. I am with them. In the forest, I see Baco. I see Magdalene. The three of us are together when my mind leaves. I am back with them. 
With the monster wearing the woodsman's face approaching me, I searched for something to protect myself. In the darkness I could feel the rough shape of a crucifix. You can see me, Karagen. If you let your mind leave while your body grows, you can be with the cat again. He was a good cat. She was a... I expected screams. I expected him to writhe in pain, but he didn't. As I stabbed the woodsman's long arm with a crucifix, he didn't even flinch. You can see Mika again, he repeated, his head descending to my eye level. You just have to let your mind leave your body. His lips flared up, revealing a row of dull yellow teeth. Even under the dim shine of my flashlight, I could see the raving hatred inside his eyes. Without a second thought, I threw myself into the moonlight. I didn't register the broken glass. I didn't think about where I was running. I just ran, and I knew he was behind me, and I knew he meant me harm. I ran to the nearest place I could hide, the woodsman's barn. With the barn doors barred behind me and my flashlight off, I hid in the darkness of the wooden enclosure. I prayed that the long-necked monstrosity would stop at the door, that he would hunt different prey, and for a moment I thought my prayers had been answered. But with another horrid grunt, the creature knocked the barn doors down. Don't be scared, he whispered as his limbs felt around for me in the darkness. Let me help you. Let me help your mind. Leave your body so that you can see Mika again. I watched him move through the cracks of light from the outside world. His confounding shape drifted in and out of darkness as he moved around the space, sniffing for me. His neck strained closer. His spit smelled of an infected wound. There you are, he said, breathing heavily through his nose. You will see Mika again soon enough. You will be together again. Long-legged beast stood before me, its dull tooth more clicking and leaking. You will see your friends soon enough. The monster boomed as it craned its neck for the kill. Just let your mind leave your po- A flash of light. As soon as the shot came out of the woodsman's rifle, I dropped the gun. For a moment, I stood in the darkness, waiting for the beast to spring back into action. Waiting to die. But I didn't. Instead, all the dogs in the village started to howl. With one quick flip of my flashlight, I made sure that the shot had been true. It was. The woodsman's head had a hole in it and the monstrosity that it was attached to lay dead on the barn floor. Without a second thought, I turned off my flashlight and ran to the pub. I didn't even make it halfway down the road when I met my father. He was in the drunken procession of the pubmen, armed with axes and pitchforks. Apparently someone had heard my rifle go off. My father thought I would be safer back home. I didn't argue. I barely slept that night. Images of nightmarish creatures and fears of being pulled out of my bed for murder haunted any attempt I made at sleep. Yet when I made my way downstairs in the morning, there was no talk of monsters or murder. The story was simple. During the night, the woodsman had shot himself. I told you there was no helping that man, my father said as we ate breakfast. In this he was right. The man that I had seen the night before was beyond saving. The man I had seen the night before was no longer a man. I thought about leaving the matter be, and not pushing it further, but a curiosity still lingered somewhere deep inside of my mind. Dad? I asked. Was it really a bear that killed Baco? Yes, he said without hesitation. The woodsman's dog was killed by a bear, and then he shot himself. We will not speak of this matter anymore. Leave it be. I stayed silent. 
I stayed silent partially because I knew that if I kept on asking questions, I might end up revealing some of my own secrets. But I also stayed silent because of the fear in my father's eyes. He knew that it wasn't a bear that maimed the woodsman's dog. He knew that the bullet that killed the woodsman wasn't self-inflicted. He knew that when he died, the woodsman was far from human. I stayed silent because from the look in my father's eyes, I could tell that the missing puzzle pieces to the woodsman's story were ones of jagged iron. I stayed silent because the madness that laid behind the man's transformation was beyond my comprehension. I stayed silent because I knew the matter of the woodsman and his dog was better left alone. I stole a sheep from Baba Yaga. I've been punished accordingly. For years my soul has been heavy with guilt and fear. For countless nights I have stayed dreamless, questioning whether my transgression could ever be forgiven. I have spoken to the village priest, I have kneeled down in the confessional, yet whenever the time for me to ask forgiveness from God comes, I cannot speak. I cannot verbalize the nature of my sin. So instead I come here, to this corner of the world made of wire and screens. Perhaps by sharing my story with the faithless choir of the internet I will be able to find some amount of respite. I sincerely hope that by confessing to the masses I will be able to rid myself of some of the guilt. But I know that even if I forgive myself for what I have done, the fear of what I have brought into the world will never leave me. I have stolen a sheep from the Baba Yaga and I have been punished accordingly. For most of my adult life I was enjoyed as a construction worker in Austria. The pay was better than anything I could get back in the village. Work came in manageable bursts, and during the winters I could rest back in eastern Slovakia with my wife. We were trying for a child. We were hopeful for the future. One misplaced steel beam skewered all of that. After the surgeries and after the recuperation I could walk, but no construction would hire a cripple. There were odd jobs around the village, and my wife had taken to selling woolen hats on the internet. But most folks in rural Slovakia are handy with a hammer, and one cannot feed a family with hats. Our savings got us through the first winter, and the charity of our neighbours made sure we never went hungry, but time was running out. A second winter approached, and our neighbour's grace wasn't infinite. Every moment of my life, an alarm clock counted down above my head, steadily leaking dread. It is with that invisible clock just a couple ticks away from my family going hungry that I met the sheep. I was hobbling in the forest when I found it. Perhaps I was there to clear my mind, or maybe I was convinced that with enough walking I could cure myself. But regardless of what thoughts were drifting through my mind, as soon as I saw the sheep my attention was singular. The animal stood opposite me on the dirt path. A chewed off rope dangled off of its neck, and its eyes were dumb as those as any barnyard animal. But there was something about the sheep's wool that made the rest of the forest disappear. Without a second thought, I made my way up to the creature and stroked its fur. Like a soft summer wind, the wool caressed my palm. Somewhere in the cozy embrace of the comfort, a thought started to manifest. My wife could do wonders with this wool. Bah, the sheep said, as if agreeing with me. I looked around. We were alone in the forest. There were no witnesses. Yet before my mind stumbled down that dark path, my eyes drifted towards the rope around the sheep's neck. Someone had the sheep tied up. Someone owned the sheep. And the animal had simply ran away. I bit down on my morals, grabbed one end of the rope, and led the sheep down the path back to where it came from. I convinced myself that its owners would be happy if I brought the animal back and might even provide a reward. I convinced myself that I was doing the right thing. As we walked, however, I couldn't help but look to the sheep's ears. Neither of them was marked. 
The sheep did not have an owner, not legally, at least. Bah, the sheep said, as if agreeing with me. The way from which the sheep came was not an easy one to walk. The path turned jagged and steep, and for a moment I feared that my leg couldn't handle it, but I pushed on regardless. A voice deep in my mind demanded I do the right thing. After a painful climb, I reached a clearing on the top of the hill. Before the sheep and me stood the queerest cottage I had ever seen. It was built of tile and logs, just like any other home one could see in the village, but the cottage had no door. The cottage had no front door and stood a couple meters off the ground on top of what looked like giant chicken legs. In lieu of an entrance, there was a ladder that led up to the base of the home. A rope, chewed down to a stub, hung from one of the steps. My healthy leg went numb thinking of how painful the journey up the ladder would be. Is anyone home? I yelled at the cottage in the sky. I found your sheep! I waited and waited, but there was no response. The rope was beyond repair, and wolves were known to stoke the woods. I figured that the sheep would be safer with me. I convinced myself that taking the sheep back home was the right thing to do. Bah! The sheep said, as if agreeing with me. When I walked inside our cottage, I took the sheep with me. We had no barn to house the animal, and I feared that if someone saw the sheep tied up in the front of the cottage, they might take us for thieves. Hiding the animal in the hallway, I went to prepare my wife for our new house guest. When I entered, she was ecstatic. While I was out hobbling in the woods, my wife found an antique set of porcelain whilst cleaning out the attic. After a cursory glance online, she tracked down a collector that was willing to part with a hefty sum for the cups. I was excited about her money-making opportunity, but she was not excited about mine. When I opened the door to reveal the animal in the hallway, my wife was furious. She told me that I should have left the sheep where it belonged, and I would have stayed away from such a strange cottage, that I should have kept my own business. Yet, when I convinced her to touch the sheep, when she truly understood the softness of its wool, my wife relented. From those clouds of white, she could make hats fit for a lord. Combined with the porcelain money, we could comfortably scrape by through the coming winter. Bah! The sheep said, as if celebrating with us. For a while, we simply ran our hands through the sheep's wool, bathing in our good fortune. But soon enough, a question slithered into the room. I do not know if it was I or her that verbalized the sentiment but it was in the air long before it was said. How much can you sell a sheep for? Bah! The sheep said, as if it too found the question interesting. At first my wife and me simply guessed. We fantasized about what we could do with a sudden influx of money. Soon enough, however, the yearning for the potential money galvanized into a concrete need. With the hat and porcelain profits, we could scrape by but if we sold the sheep, we could prosper. That evening, I left my wife alone with our soft house guest and made my way up to the pub. Halshin, the portly general store owner, was quick with a price estimate, but he was even quicker to ask about the sheep. At first, I avoided the topic and told him I was merely curious about the economics of animal husbandry, but with a couple of palenka shots, he loosened my tongue. Ah, Furko, you scoundrel! Alshin laughed as I finished whispering my tale. And you say the sheep isn't marked? I nodded. Well, aren't you lucky that I have a cousin with a stamping machine? Would be more than happy to help find the sheep a home. If a small finder's fee would be involved, that is. How much? I asked. Five euros, he said. Nothing steep. It's been a hard year. All I'm looking for is a symbolic price. We'll even help you find a buyer. With a handshake, it was settled. With a handshake, I had crossed the line from a reluctant good Samaritan to a thief. After a couple shots of Palenka, we sat down with the woodsman. His wife had started raising sheep just a couple months prior. After a couple more shots, we had a buyer. 
The barkeep kept the palenka shots coming, and the closing time of the pub dragged long into the night. By the time we were finally asked to leave, all the road lights had been extinguished. With borrowed flashlights, our ethanol-scented crowd started to stagger its way back home. Even in its drunkenness, the group moved far too fast for my hobbled walk. Soon enough, the other beams of light disappeared. Soon enough, it was just me, the village road, and the dark forest beyond. After months of worry, I finally found a moment of respite. In the euphoria of alcohol and the sudden financial gain, I found myself happy. Peasant, have you by any chance seen a sheep come through here? The voice of an old woman creaked out of the darkness. The damned animal has chewed through the rope that held it. I sense that it might have come through here. There was a gentleness in her tone, as if she wasn't calling me a peasant as an insult, but rather as a means of stating a fact. I spun my flashlight searching for the stranger, but found only more darkness. Are you deaf or are you dumb, peasant? The voice asked, its kindness crackling. Have you seen a sheep come through here? I wanted to say the truth. I wanted to do the right thing and return the stolen. But the alcohol in my breath had different plans. No, I said. I haven't seen any sheep. You must be mistaken. A pinch. Out of nowhere, I found my arm clasped between two rough fingers. Liar! She hissed as she squeezed my skin. When my flashlight caught her, I saw a face so grotesque it gave me a fright. Her face was so old. Desperately old. Her skin sagged like that of an old melted sculpture, and the thin wisps of white on her scalp seemed like nothing but a memory of hair. But it was her eyebrows that truly terrified me. On the wrinkled, pale face, they stood sharp and red and defiant. I know you stole my sheep, peasant, the hag said, smiling with the few teeth she had left. There is no need to lie to me. I know all, and I forgive all for a price. The hag cackled, each rasping breath of air shaking her stout body. Even though the flashlight was bright when I left the pub, it started to flicker. It was as if it refused to be a part of the bargain, as if the business of the sheep was purely concerning me and the darkness beyond. What is the price? I asked cautiously. Oh, peasant, the price is a single kiss. But I am an old woman who misses the affections of a handsome man. I will happily trade the animal for a memory of the past. I took a step back. My leg groaned the same way it did before a thunderstorm. No, I said. I have not seen a sheep, and I will not kiss you. I wish you a good night, auntie. I moved away from the mad hag as fast as I could, but her voice continued to creak through the darkness. Silly peasant, she said, her voice turning cold. A lie has short legs, but the punishment for it does not. May you never forget your transgression, May you never forget that you are a liar and a thief. May you never forgive yourself for rejecting my advances. I curse you, peasant. I curse you and everyone that you care for. May the whole village suffer for your misdeeds. The hag's voice echoed through my head all the way to my front door. Yet when I came home, I did not tell my wife. That hag's disfigured face, the strange eyebrows, her cruel words. It was all still setting in my mind, and I could not bring myself to verbalize my worries. I also didn't want to worry her. The potential of the antique porcelain and the wool and the money from the sheep it all made her so happy, so hopeful. I did not want to take away that hope again. 
She tried to lure me into the bedroom with soft whispers, but my mind was far too scattered for romance, and my body was in no shape for love. Instead of rejoining my wife in bed, I stayed in the living room with our woolen house guest and the antique porcelain. It had been a long day, and there was plenty to consider. Yet as I sat there with nothing but the crackling of the fireplace to keep me company, I started to relax. I had woken up that morning as a man who feared the inevitable hunger that comes with poverty. But through a cascade of circumstance, I knew that the ticking clock above my head had been pushed back. With the antique porcelain, we would be able to put food on the table. And, if I never told anyone about the hag, the sheep could still be sold to the woodsman. My life had taken an absurd turn, but sitting there, in the dim light of my cottage, I knew things would get better. Bah! said the sheep as if it disagreed with me. The creature was staring straight at me, but the barnyard dumbness in its eyes had drifted off and given way to a different look. It was only through the flickers of the fireplace that I could see the sheep, but the emotion in its eyes was unmistakable. Behind the animal's slitted eyes, there was a raging, never-ending source of hatred. Meh! The sheep screamed as it started to lumber towards me. The animal no longer trotted like it did in the forest path. Its legs moved clumsily in the woolen floor, as if they were foreign to the animal. With a gust of light from the fireplace, I realized they were. The sheep was no longer standing on its old sheep legs. Instead, the animal's woolen body was balancing on a steadily growing set of fleshy stilts. Bah! The sheep screamed revealing a set of dull teeth and dark rolling tongue. Bah! With ice in my veins, I limped off the couch and moved towards the back door. What I was looking at was no longer a sheep, and what was looking back at me meant me harm. Yet somewhere in my terrified mind, I hoped that if I opened the door, if I allowed the creature to escape, that I would be left unharmed. The outside world breezed in through the open door. The stumbling beast stopped and regarded the forest beyond the cottage. Its legs continued to grow, but the animal didn't take another step. Bah! It screamed, and then it craned its neck towards the open door. For a moment, the animal simply shook, its woolen body heaving with effort. But as the beast continued to strain its neck, its body once again started to change. At first, the growth came in small, staggering bursts, as if the sheep's neck was a tangled rope being pulled out. But soon enough, the stretching of the neck became constant. The beast's malformed body was starting to press up against the ceiling of the cottage, yet its horrible maw was hanging out of the back door. Bah! The creature screamed out into the darkness. I backed up against the hallway door, eager to make my escape. Yet as soon as I touched the door, the creature before me buckled. For a split second, I registered the sound of broken porcelain. And that tragedy became quickly irrelevant. The tall-legged beast stood directly in front of me, its horrible jowls descending toward me. The look in the animal's eyes was unmistakable. It wanted me dead. The creature roared, sending out a torrent of spit that smelled of infection. The beast's entire body shivered with murderous anticipation. The fluffy woolen coat that had once brought me such comfort was transformed into clumps of mucus-covered hair. The creature dripped onto the wooden floor as it lumbered towards me. Bah! I knew I couldn't run. I knew that my crippled leg wouldn't carry me if I were to attempt to escape the long-legged beast. So instead, I chose to hide. Like a terrified child, I ducked beneath the table like a naive infant. I desperately hoped that the beast would simply leave me. For a moment, among the broken porcelain and ill-smelling detritus, I almost believed I would be safe. But I wasn't. The long-necked beast swooped its head below the table and with one swift motion overturned the piece of furniture. I was lying on the floor in front of the beast that looked as if it belonged in hell itself. 
The skeletal limbs of the creature braced for attack. Its pale grey skin shed the rest of its woolen coat. I was about to be killed by a nightmare made of flesh. The creature roared, readying its jaws for murder. The universe nearly came to a halt. Before me, I could see the spite-filled eyes of the beast. I could see the wet teeth that were about to tear into my skin. I could also see something else. The bristles of a broom. I watched as the rough strands of the tool scratched against the beast's wet, cruel eyes. The beast yelped as it retracted its head. My wife hit it with the broom again. She swung away at it, screaming, demanding that the monstrosity leave our home. In a state of pure shock and blindness, the animal stumbled towards her, smashed into the wall, and ran out into the wilderness. For a moment, all we could do was stare out into the forest beyond. Then my wife closed the door. Once our promised sources of wealth lay on the floor, broken and sticky. For a while, we mourned the loss of our newfound wealth. For a while, we tried to make sense of the madness. But eventually, we stopped talking. There was nothing left to be said. I had brought sin into our home, and we had been punished. My wife grabbed her broom. I grabbed a rag, and we cleaned our floor of any trace of the stolen animal or antique porcelain. Neither of us slept that night. Sleep in general has not been the same since that night. It had been two years since I stolen the sheep from that chicken-legged cottage in the woods. Yet I still cannot bring myself to talk about it. I wanted to let go of the guilt. I want to carry on. But my transgression will not be a simple theft. If I had simply stolen something, I would seek atonement with a priest... Yet the nature of my sin does not only lie in breaking one of the commandments. The raving horror, that monstrosity which ruined my home, it is a being of pure evil. It is a being of pure evil and I am responsible for bringing it into existence. For years my soul has been heavy with guilt and fear. For years I have searched for forgiveness Yet I know I will never truly find it. My theft might have been forgotten, and the long-necked creature may have been driven away from the village. But I know that somewhere out in the Magura forest, the long-legged beast still walks. Until it is dead. Until I can be sure that it can no longer bring harm to anyone. I will never sleep easy. A cryptid hunter visited my village to kill the long-legged beast of Magura Forest. I'm lucky I walked away alive. The village pub was no place for a woman. Yes, our wives and daughters would occasionally cross the threshold of our sanctuary to drag us back to our duties, but none of them ever sat down for a drink. There were no written rules, but there was an understanding. The pub was under the dominion of the village men. It was because of this unwritten rule that we stared at her. The sword she had sheathed across her back only intensified our curiosity. She rode in shortly after sunset, her boots heavy with snow and her step filled with purpose. Without looking at our table, she sat down at the bar and ordered a shot of palenka. The barkeep laughed and offered her a soda, but his demeanor quickly changed. She might have given him a look, that the rest of us were not privy to, but most likely the barkeep simply noticed the hilt of her sword. Without a second word, he poured her her liquor. In one fell swoop, she swallowed the shot and then asked for another. At first we all sat there, wordless, studying the stranger who had entered our secluded slice of civilization, but soon enough, Halshin, the portly general store owner, verbalized our communal curiosity. Young miss, he said, leaning forward in his chair. May I inquire what brings you to our humble village? 
As far as I know, there are no medieval fairs planned for the near future. There's no need for a sword in this part of the country. His joke released some of the invisible tension that had festered in the pub, but when the woman turned around, the laughter ceased. The tall-legged beast, she said, her eyes as piercing as the mountain wind. I have no idea what to speak of, Halshin said, doing a poor job at masking his discomfort. Has anyone here heard about this tall-legged beast? The men shook their heads, but their eyes told a different story. We all knew what she was talking about. A week prior, the woodsman had stumbled into the pub, telling frantic stories of a long-legged beast. It attacked him and his dog in the forest. They both survived the horror, but there was something wrong with them. Within a fortnight, the dog was dead. Within a week of that, the woodsman was dead as well. Pray tell the young miss, Halshin said, trying to steady his voice. Who told you these tales of this supposed tall-legged beast? Are you sure you didn't simply hear an exaggerated story of the bear attack our village experienced a while back? The stories I have heard were not of a bear attack. The stories I have heard were concerning a beast of entirely different nature. The stories I have heard were about a creature of long limbs and eyes filled with darkness, she said towering above us from the bar chair. I have come here to rid you of this beast. Under whose orders? Halshin asked. My employers are not of your concern. What is of your concern is the creature that roams the forest near your village. Surely you have seen his work. Surely you understand the threat that it poses to your little community. It was us, the men around the table that found the woodsman's body. It was us that buried the disfigured corpse, and it was us that hid the reality of his long-legged transformation beneath the lie of suicide. We had seen the long-legged beast's work. Who sent you? Halcyon asked with a voice of pure ice. The beast that roams your forest is not an animal, she said, ignoring his question. The beast that roams your forest is a curse manifested. With each bite that beast delivers, the curse spreads. While the long-legged creature continues to roam your forests, the village will suffer. I'm here to put an end to the suffering. How? I found myself asking. Halcyon's brow furrowed. I had spoken out of turn, yet my question was deemed pertinent. My friend Furco makes a good point. Let's hypothetically say this long-legged beast does exist. How would one of such a tender nature such as yourself be able to help? Hunting, be it cursed animals or not, is a man's- As soon as she put her hand on the hilt of her sword, Halshin went quiet. It is in your best interest to not judge my character, lest you want to see exactly how untender my nature is, she said. For a brief moment, it looked as if we would be witnessing another death, but then the stranger's grip relaxed. I am not here to argue. I am not here to fight. I came to this pub to help you rid of this beast. Without thinking, I found my mouth moving once more. How? I asked. The beast is a result of a curse, and curses do not manifest out of the ether, the stranger said looking at me. Once I find the person who brought the long-legged beast into this world, it will be easier to put it to rest. With fear in my heart, my eyes drifted to my empty glass. The stranger did not look away. Does anyone here have a guilty conscience? Has anyone here tangled with forces beyond their means? No one spoke. I kept my eyes glued to the table. I kept my eyes away from hers, yet I knew she was looking straight at me. I knew she knew. No one? No one here has a heavy heart? I almost spoke. I almost confessed to my sin, but Halshin opened his mouth before I could open mine. Young miss, I apologize for offending you with my comments, but 
Now you are offending us. We are all Christians here. We may not be saints, but we do not commune with the darkness that you speak of. The beast that roams the forest is not of our doing. But you admit the existence of this beast, the stranger said, her lips lingering on the edge of a smile. I admit nothing. I am simply making conversation. Well, if everyone else here is a saint, then the presence of the beast is truly puzzling, the stranger said her eyes still glued to me. Yet this does not change the nature of the work that needs to be done. One way or another, I will put this beast to rest. To do that, however, I will need a guide for these forests. I do not know the land this far south. I'll go, I found myself saying. Furko, have you lost your mind? Halcyon yelled. You're a cripple! You have no business in the forest! I have a horse, she said. The man does not need to walk. He just needs to know the forest. I know the forest, I said. Then you'll do. Now all that is left is the matter of my horse. The animal needs to rest before the hunt. Is there a stable available? Alshin did not look at the woman. Instead, he glared at me. For a second, it almost looked as if he would bar me from joining the huntress, but eventually his sneer loosened. The woodsman had a barn, he said. He's no longer making use of it. I'll show you where it is. Lead the way, the stranger replied. Without looking back at the table, I limped out of the pub. I couldn't look the others in the eye. The walk to the woodsman's barn was long and silent. Each step that I took with my bad leg felt like a muffled bolt of lightning traveling up my spine, my bones shivering the same way that they do before a thunderstorm. I moved slowly, yet she didn't complain. The huntress simply led her horse behind me and kept her eyes on the dark forest beyond the village. After we found the woodsman's body, we cleaned the barn as thoroughly as we could. For a group of drunks, we did a good job. Yet on the far side of the barn, nestled into the darkness of the wood, there was still a trace of dried crimson. The huntress noticed it as soon as she entered. I presume the man's house is vacant as well? Yes. Good. Did you know the woodsman well? Yes. I offer you my condolences then, she said, hitching the horse. Meet me here tomorrow at sunrise. We'll make sure the long-legged beast doesn't hurt anyone else. With that, she retired to the dead man's cottage. I went back home to my wife. A part of me wanted to tell her. A part of me wanted to tell her that her husband might not come back the following day. Yet I couldn't. She knew about my transgression. She had witnessed the birth of the long-legged beast. That was enough heartache for her. I did not sleep that night. I simply lay there, listening to her gently snore at my chest, listening to her dream. As the first rays of sunshine started to creep into our bedroom, I prayed that I would hear those carefree hums again. The night of my wedding, my father-in-law gave me a shotgun. When he gave me the gift, he said that every man should be able to defend his family. I didn't know how useful I would be with a weapon I had never shot, but I took it with me regardless. With a knitted hat from my wife and a shotgun from her father, I set out to hunt the long-legged beast. The morning was unseasonably warm and humid. Instead of having frigid teeth, the air outside was heavy, and each breath I took felt sluggish. Through thick fog... I limped my way to the woodsman's barn. When I arrived, the huntress was already bringing out the horse. Without even the slightest bit of resistance, the creature carried me. The animal didn't acknowledge me in the slightest. Neither did the huntress, who walked a few paces before us. The walk through the village was just as wordless as it had been the night prior. I found myself trying to make sense of the symbols carved into the hilt of the huntress's sword. So what happened? 
she asked nonchalantly as we left the village. What did you do to be cursed? I stole a sheep. Saying the words filled me with equal part relief and terror. Being able to confess to the sin that brought forth the long-legged beast eased my heart, yet the absurdity of it all shook me. This was all happening because of one measly sheep. If I was able to provide for my family, I wouldn't have... Wait, I said. How did you know it was me? I have a nose for these things. Presume you stole the sheep from someone who lives in the forest? Yes, I said, trying to make sense of the world beyond the fog. The sheep was tied to a cottage that stood on a chicken leg. The animal chewed off the rope that held it and I took it home. Cottage on a chicken leg? She asked, a hint of amusement sneaking to her voice. Wrinkly old hag, glass eye, body like a sack of potatoes. Yes, I said, her horrid voice, her sagging face. I could see them again. She's the one who cursed me. How were her eyebrows? Her eyebrows? Yeah, big and red and drawn on. Like giant crimson birds descending on her beady eyes whenever she blinked. I remembered. Yes. Classic Baba. Presume she asked for your firstborn in order to forgive the theft? No. She asked for a kiss. The huntress stopped. So did the horse. A kiss? She asked, her voice flat with disbelief. Yes. She said she missed the company of men and would forgive the theft if I gave her a kiss. Should I have kissed her? Would that have... The huntress keeled over in laughter. She found the idea of the hag asking me for a kiss so funny that it stole away her breath. <laughs> Sorry, she said, trying to compose herself. Just funny seeing how desperate the old girl has gotten. I did not share her sense of humor. Don't worry, she said, calming herself and continued to walk. By the end of the day, the long-legged beast will be taken care of. Will I have to... Will I have to kiss the hag? I wasn't joking. Won't she burst out laughing again? No, she said, tears clearing out of her eyes. No, you won't have to kiss the Baba Yaga. Would the woodsman and his dog still be alive if I kissed her? The huntress's smile disappeared. Suddenly, she didn't find the hag's desperation funny. No, she said. Baba is a cruel creature. If you did what she asked of you, she would find a different way to cause you suffering. You simply stole a sheep from the wrong person. And these things happen. I'm not a thief. Those words dropped out of my mouth without an input. Shame rushed through my body like a steel beam through flesh. I used to work construction. I used to be able to provide for my family. If it wasn't for the accident, if I could still work, I would never have thought about stealing that animal. You stole the sheep, but you've been punished sufficiently. After today, the long-legged beast won't hurt anyone else. I promise things will turn for the better. The forest path was one of melting snow and mud. Out beyond the fog, I could see the silhouettes of trees yet the rest of the world was a universe of cloudy grey. The path up to the clearing where I found the cottage was steeper than I remembered, yet both the huntress and her horse walked it with utter ease. Is this the place? she asked, stopping on the edge of the clearing. Is this the place you stole the sheep from? I think so. It does look familiar, but I can't see the cottage. Baba never stays in one spot for long, but her creations do. The long-legged beast is nearby. She unsheathed her sword and studied it. Even in the dullness of the overcast day, the weapon shimmered with sharpness. There is only one way to break a curse, she said, testing the blade. You have to forgive yourself. A curse stemming from an absolved sin holds little power. The horse suddenly took three quick steps forward and continued to walk. I have to forgive myself, 
I turned around on the saddle, hoping to face the huntress. But all I saw around me was fog. You're not a thief, her voice drifted around me. Remember that you are not a thief, and I will take care of the rest. I made a few desperate attempts to understand what was happening, but the huntress responded to none of my questions. It was just me and the horse, blindly walking through the fog. With the huntress gone, my mind became a crackling thunderstorm of panic. Every wet step that the horse took through the muddy clearing brought forth a new image of how the long-legged beast could maim me. Yet then, in the mess of melting snow and wet earth, I saw something that focused my mind. It ran deep into the ground and was partially filled with the muddy water. Yet the imprint in the mud was unmistakable. Long flat hooves, similar to those of a deer, but scores larger. Just as the woodsman described it, the night him and his dog were attacked. The tracks before me belonged to the long-legged beast. The horse was leading me straight to it. I immediately started praying, hoping that a last-minute Hail Mary might draw the attention of a loving god. The horse continued walking towards the beast born of my sin. When prayers ran out, I started to rationalize. I started to convince myself that I had simply taken home a lost sheep, that I would not have stolen an animal if my financial situation had been different. The tracks around us grew sharper, more recent. Somewhere off in the fog I could hear the sounds of heavy breathing. The beast was near. The horse's ears shot backwards. As calm as the creature had been the entire journey, now he was nervous. From above us came a series of throaty pained grunts, and then, out of the fog, emerged two massive pale legs. It wasn't until the horse stopped that I realized it was shaking. Whatever shiver was going through the animal's body passed on to me. I wanted to reach for the shotgun. I wanted to call for help. I wanted to do something to guarantee my survival, yet all I could do is sit, stare, and shake. The beast's maw descended on me like an unavoidable fever dream. The creature's neck throbbed with an unspeakable power. Chunks of hardened pus dripped out of its sickly jowls, but it was the eyes. It was the eyes that truly struck terror into being. The long-legged beast stared at me with a look that forced any idea of religion out of my mind. If the eyes are the window to the soul, then the creature that stood before me was a towering example of a spirit made of pure spite and malice. Behind those hateful beads of black rested a godless being that wanted nothing more than to see me dead. I opened my mouth to scream, but no words came out. I simply sat on the horse, slack-jawed, the images of the woodsman's long-limbed corpse shaking my soul. The creature let out another unearthly grunt, drizzling me with chunks of foul-smelling spit. I was going to die. Or worse, I was going to end up like the woodsman. I am not a thief! I suddenly found myself yelling. I am not a thief and you have no power over me! The beast head cocked to the side. For a split second, the hatred in its eyes gave way to confusion. But that confusion soon disappeared. Soon the creature's purple tongue was caressing its yellow teeth. Whatever forgiveness I had pried away from the depths of my soul was useless. The curse still held. And I was going to die. With throbbing effort, the long-legged abomination craned its neck backwards, preparing for the kill. From the pale curtain of the fog, another throaty grunt echoed. I knew that it would be the last sound I would ever hear. I knew that I would end up just as the woodsman did. The horrid roar rang through my ears. I became dizzy with the anticipation of death, but then... It stopped. With a gentle flash of light somewhere off in the fog, the beast's roar came to an abrupt end. The horse stopped shaking, but my muscles still shivered. 
For what seemed like an eternity, we stood in the clearing in complete silence. But then... Thud. The creature's head collapsed in the mud just a meter or two next to me. Its tall limbs still stood their ground in the muddy earth, but a thick trail of dark blood was starting to worm its way down the creature's neck. With its hateful eyes shut, the animal looked harmless, nearly comical. Good job, she said, emerging out of the fog. The killing blow bloodied the shine of her sword. With one swipe of a rag, she cleaned the weapon. You can rest easy now. Is it dead? Does it look dead? The fog that had plagued the morning was starting to ease. The horrid universe of fear which I had lived in for so long was starting to dissipate. The long-legged bee still stood on its misshapen limbs, but the gaping hole at its throat soothed my nerves. It looks dead, I said, watching the blood slide down the beast's maw. Then logic would dictate it is probably dead. She sheathed her sword and gave the horse a friendly tap. Good job, she said. I wasn't sure if she was talking to me or the horse. So it's over? I asked, still uncomfortable with the legs that stood before me. The long-legged beast is dead. Your village is safe, she said, smiling. Next time you see a sheep walking through the woods, just make sure that groans... Two high-pitched groans strain their way into existence from the long-legged beast, yet the creature's horrible maw remained closed. The sounds came from the wounds at the monstrosity's throat. Shit, she said, reaching for her weapon. Move back. The horse took a couple steps back, as if he understood the huntress's words. What's happening? I asked, but the huntress never answered. She didn't need to. With a series of steadily deepening groans, the wound at the beast's throat opened up. Two more heads, equally grotesque, equally hateful, squirmed their way out of the creature's body. The long-legged beast was far from dead. The huntress leapt into action, slicing through the throats of the newly born heads, yet her sword did nothing to quell the monster. Even though she moved with the grace of an armed ballet dancer, every killing blow she delivered to the abomination simply resulted in the birth of two more heads. The writhing nightmare of necks that stood before us frightened me to my core. But it wasn't until the huntress turned around that I realized how dire the situation was. The only person who I had ever witnessed to be composed about the long-legged beast was no longer calm. We need to get out of here! She said, her voice drenched in panic. With a couple more swings of her sword that gave birth to a quartet of new pus-filled jaws, the huntress jumped onto the horse. When she mounted the animal, her boots sent a flurry of agony through the injured leg, but there was far too much adrenaline in my blood to make the pain anything more than a mere blip in my frenzied mind. The galloping of the horse was fast and true, yet it was no match for the beast. Even when the long limbs... Even with the dozen chomping heads, the creature behind us was matching our speed. A minefield of deep cracks spread out in front of us. The horse was starting to stumble. The shotgun! Shoot the beast with the shotgun! Every ounce of focus I could wring from my being, I held the weapon in my shaking hands. My fingers were numb, barely recognizing the metal of the trigger, yet when I pulled it, bang! The shot went wide. Before I even had a chance to contend with my missed shot, however, another horrible sound cut through my ears. A feeling of weightlessness followed the horse's scream. I was flying through the air. Somewhere behind me, the horse had tripped on the tracks of the long-legged beast. My leg was the first part of my body to meet the ground. The screams that left my throat completely consumed my being. For a moment, I wasn't in the Slovakian wilderness. For a brief intermission, in reality, I was back at an Austrian construction site, watching a marriage of steel and bone destroy my livelihood. Yet it wasn't caring co-workers that stood above me when I regained my footing in reality. The creature that towered above me was far from caring. A sea of maddened eyes descended upon me, 
my nose filled with the stench of death. I lay in the mud, paralyzed by my fear and pain, watching the throbbing symphony of necks descend. They all beat in unison, drumming to the beat of a massive heart. With nothing else to lose, my finger wrapped around the trigger once more. Bang! The world came crashing down on me. I woke up certain that I had died. I could see nothing, and all that I could feel was bone-crushing pain. I had stolen a sheep from the Baba Yaga, and this was my punishment. Eternal darkness and pain. Yet as I lay in the murky depths of the afterlife, another sensation started to crawl through my perception. I could feel the cold wetness of mud against my back. I could hear the singing of far-off forest birds. My finger was still wrapped against the trigger of the shotgun. With a grunt, a gentle female grunt, sunlight entered my world. The hunter stood above me, smiling. You survived. The body of the long-legged beast lay next to me, reeking of death and gunpowder. It's dead, don't worry. Are you sure? She kicked aside the clump of half-grown heads, revealing a jagged shotgun hole where the beast's heart once was. Sure enough, she said. This long-legged beast will no longer harm your village. The curse has been broken. Looks like the killing blow had to come from you. Let's take you back to the civilized. The sight of the unmoving monstrosity didn't even properly dawn on me when a new problem presented itself. I couldn't get up. I couldn't feel my legs. My pants were covered in blood and below the cloth, subtle but crushing, I could see the jagged peaks of crushed bones. It took me more than a year to learn how to walk after a steel beam went through my leg. The injuries of the hunt were incomparable to my construction site accident. I would never walk again. I can't get up. That's all I managed to say before the tears ceased my throat. When all that plagued me was one bad leg, I kept some semblance of hope in my heart. I kept a token amount of faith that one day I would be able to gainfully be employed and provide for my family. But looking down at my mangled limbs, I knew that I would never work construction again. I knew that I would be a burden to my wife for the rest of our lives. The huntress stood and watched me weep in the mud, occasionally looking at her horse as if he could deal with the situation in her stead. But then a light bulb went off behind her eyes. Unsheathing her sword, she made her way to the corpse of the long-legged beast. After a brief staccato of broken bones and some wet noises of guts being pushed apart, she re-emerged. In her hands, she held a tight glob of green flesh. With nimble fingers, she picked out the chunks of buckshot out of the beast's heart. Take off your pants. With the sorrow and agony storming through my soul, I had no energy left to question or argue. Beneath the cloth, I could see shards of my own bones. I averted my tear-filled eyes and stared at the trees of the Magora Forest. At first, I felt nothing. At first, all I felt was a crushing numbness in the part of my body which no longer was my own. But slowly, ever so slowly, I felt it. Like a soft summer wind, like the gentle wool of the sheep that I stole, I felt feeling return to my legs. Can you get up now? I didn't answer. I just tried. My pants were off and my face was covered in tears, but for the first time in years I felt whole. I can walk, I said, taking a step with legs that no longer inspired charity. Each step was true. It was as if there was never a long-legged beast. As if there never was a construction accident at all. I can walk! I yelled, breaking into a sprint. I can run! I can work! I can provide! Like a child, I ran laps around the corpse of the beast that once plagued my nightmares. The huntress simply watched me, entertained by my joy. How can I repay you? I asked when my lack of breath finally left me stationary. 
You've saved me. You've saved my family. I don't know how to give thanks. My payment has been taken care of by my employers, she said, mounting her horse. But that is a nice hat you're wearing. Without a question, I took the hat off and gave it to her. My wife's handiwork seemed to come from a different world than the huntress, but the woman seemed satisfied with her new hat. I hope you don't mind walking home on your own. Not at all. So long, then. Wait, I said. You saved me. You saved my family. You saved the whole village, and I know nothing of you. Please, let me treat you to a drink or a meal. I am neither hungry nor thirsty, and there is work to be done. Your thanks is good enough. Travel well, stranger. And may we never meet again. And with that, she was gone. Even though my legs were raging with energy, I couldn't bring myself to walk home. For a while, I just stood in the muddy clearing, tapping my feet to make sure they can still move, trying to make sense of it all. The hag, the woodsman, the long-legged beast, thinking of all of it, trying to make sense of everything, it simply made me dizzy. I reminded myself of what mattered. I was alive and standing on my own two feet. My wife was still gently snoring at home, and there were construction jobs littered throughout Europe that I was suddenly eligible for once more. Standing there in the clearing, I realized that even though the past few years of my life had been drenched in darkness, things were looking up. I reminded myself of what mattered, and then I walked back home to start a new life. Follow the link in the comments below for a story written and narrated by Mike Jesus Langer, the author of this tall tale.